Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In the course of his discussion of poetry and its effects on us in Republic Book 10, Plato once again tells us that the poets, and by this he means the producers of dramatic and epic and lyric poetry, so the, the culture producers of his time would need to be kicked out of the city, or at best they would have to make some sort of justification for themselves. Why take such an extreme position? Well, because Plato argues that poetry is inherently, at least the way it's been, been done in the past, corruptive to the human being. And Plato thinks of the human being as having different parts of their soul or personality um, we're not going to rehearse the entire Platonic anthropology here, but there is a higher rational part, which you can call reason or the intellect, however you want to conceive of it. And that, that part does have its pleasures, its desires. It, it is also affective as well as cognitive. And then there are the lower parts, the lower irrational parts. And in a, a well-functioning person, this higher part has been developed. There are no actual conflicts within that part. And if there are, if they're really rational, they'll, they'll think through. If they have two contradictory ideas and they're trying to hold on to both of them, they, they will realize that they have to get rid of one of them. Not so for the lower parts. The lower parts can be in conflict with themselves, with each other. They are also quite often in conflict with the higher rational part. Uh, every time that you tell yourself, I shouldn't binge watch this next uh, show in the series on Netflix or Hulu or whatever other streaming uh, device that you want, I should actually get up and do some work or go to sleep. It's three in the morning. <clears throat> there is a conflict going on between your higher rational part, which is telling you what you ought to do, and hopefully will you know, tell you what to do in such a way that it doesn't produce conflict in the rest of your, your being, and this lower part, which is saying, no, no, let's watch another show. And so how does poetry then relate to this? How does it talk to or affect the human being? Is there the possibility for imitative art, you know, uh, music, drama, poetry, uh, painting, all of these sorts of things to help the higher part of ourselves, to develop it further. This is actually something that many of the advocates of the arts do in fact say that, you know, uh, great art tends to develop the, the best things within us. Plato doesn't buy that. Plato actually says that um, that part of us, the better part, is largely ignored, unfortunately, by poetry. How can that be the case? Doesn't Homer, for example, talk about, say, Odysseus or, or you know, Mentor uh, or Nestor or these other people as having a great mind, uh, as, as thinking things through? Doesn't, don't they depict things properly for us? Don't they give us examples of great thinkers? Uh, consider movies of our own time where we take Albert Einstein or great, you know, other great uh, theorists and mathematicians and we put them into a movie and we dramatize their life. Plato would say, well, look at those things carefully. Do they really portray things accurately? Or do they give you a very distorted viewpoint of what it would be 
to have great talent in these rational endeavors. We might say similarly about those who are uh, practical reasoners, not just theoretical reasoners. Do we get depictions of proper practical reasoning from imitative arts? Or we might say imaginative or creative arts. Or do we instead get a very truncated picture? Plato would say, whether he's looking at the poetry of his own time or the equivalents in the present, that it's really the latter, that we're not getting a good depiction of a person who makes the right decisions, who reasons in the proper way. Why? In part because that's not very stimulating. It's not very exciting. It doesn't appeal to our emotions. It doesn't touch us the way that other things do. So, you know, if we want to see Abraham Lincoln making a life or death decision affecting thousands upon thousands of human beings, we have to have some dramatic music in the background and have the lighting set so that he's, you know, hunched over and, and maybe a speech or something where he, he shows the anguish within his heart. Whereas Plato would say, maybe that's actually not how good practical reasoning takes place. So what happens instead? The imitative arts, and in particular poetry, they stimulate and they strengthen the lower parts of ourselves, the appetites, the part of ourselves that's higher than the appetites that he calls thumos, that is concerned with courage, cowardice, anger, and social status or honor and desires honor. Um, those parts get emphasized both within the depictions of people and in the recipients within the audience, or as he's calling them here in this uh, uh, particular passage, the judges, the critics, right? The, 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 literally the critics, the people who observe the drama and then make judgments about it. And how does it do this? Plato says that we enjoy imitation. So there's a certain pleasure involved in viewing imitations of people within particular situations. And uh, we get examples of how, not just how we ought to behave, but how we ought to think, how we ought to make decisions, how we ought to value things. And according to Plato, these are actually bad examples. So he, he provides us with some great discussions of this. He says, um, think about a person who um, has a great loss. Will that person um, resist and fight against his grief? Or will they give in to the grief and engage in lamentations? What do we see depicted in, in poetry? We see, uh, and this is actually something that I personally think is quite great about the Odyssey, we see grown men, tough guys, crying over the loss of their comrades and bewailing the fate that has brought them to that, feeling sad. And this affects us as the audience as well. Plato thinks that this is not good for us. He also mentions specifically anger as something that is aroused within us by viewing these things. And we might think in our own time about the fear of media that we consume. So he goes on and he gives a few other examples as well. Um, he says, uh, there we go. Um, if you think that the very best of us, when we hear Homer or some other of the makers of tragedy, imitating one of the heroes who's in grief, delivering a long tirade in his lamentations, chanting and beating his breast, we feel pleasure in this, and we abandon ourselves and accompany the representation with sympathy and eagerness, and we praise as an excellent poet the one who most strongly affects us in this way. We say if it doesn't affect us, then it's cold. It doesn't reach us. It doesn't take hold of us. We want drama. We want music. We want spectacle to make us feel things. And this ranges across the entire spectrum from paintings to porn and everything in between. It's all about arousing the desires, the feelings, the emotions in one way or another. So he says, now, 
when an affliction comes on us, we pride ourselves if we're able to, to resiliently resist that affliction. So why are we praising the poets for representing people in the opposite way? Now that's tragedy or epic poetry, sometimes lyric poetry as well, right? What about comedy? He says, doesn't the same principle apply to the laughable in comic representations or in private talk when we're joking around with each other? Do we take intense pleasure in buffooneries? We would blush to practice ourselves. Don't we detest them as base? But we're doing the same thing as we did with respect to the emotions that are being driven uh, and being aroused and being, you might say, even engorged and, and you know, made larger and stronger in the process. So this pleasure that we feel in representations, in imitation, in our involvement in it, ends up creating habits and mindsets. So he says, the part of the soul that was forcibly restrained and hungered for tears and a good cry and satisfaction, because it's its nature to desire these things, that's the element in us the poets satisfy and delight. The best element within us, the best part, because it has never been properly educated by reason or even habit, relaxes its guard over this other part. And he says, in so much as this is contemplating the woes of others, and it's no shame to it to praise and pity another who claims to be a good man, abandons himself to excess in his grief. It takes vicarious pleasure in it. And what happens as a result? Plato uses the metaphor of mating and reproduction here. He calls mimetic or imitative arts. He tells us that what we have going on here is actually a kind of coupling. We have the marriage or coupling or mating of a lesser art with the lower parts of ourselves producing things in, in a consequence of that. So what is the upshot of this? Poetry or any other art that we can think of in our own time that does the same sort of thing, confronting us with characters, confronting us with their responses, their emotions, their declarations about things, ruins the human person, corrupts the human person by not helping the rational part and inflaming or strengthening the lower parts, and having them placed into greater conflict with the higher rational part. They also remain in conflict with themselves because, uh, according to Plato, these parts, as irrational, can't actually be out of conflict with each other unless reason intervenes. So this means that poetry, which the Greeks were using as one of their main modes of education, both in terms of uh, theoretical subjects, but also even more in terms of practical subjects, how we ought to live, what we ought to value, how we ought to behave, why we ought to behave in that way, who we ought to listen to. We can go on and on with these topics is actually giving us a bad basis. So we would need something else in place of it.